college campus at Wilmore, which touched me about as much as anything that's occurred in 34 years of news reporting. I know normally that when you're watching television, like everyone else, you have one eye uh, perhaps on the paper, one eye on television, or one ear to someone else in the room, or perhaps you're fixing the evening meal. But for the next two and a half minutes, I wish you'd stop everything you're doing, and I think you too are going to be impressed. It started at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. Chapel was scheduled to end at 11 o'clock yesterday morning. It didn't end at 11 o'clock yesterday morning. It didn't end at 11 o'clock last night. It didn't end at 11 o'clock this morning. In fact, as Jim and I took the air, it was still going on. Let's have a look and a listen. Larry, this is quite an event here at Asbury. What does this mean to you? Oh, I can't, I can't express it. I tell you, the Lord has been planning this for so long. The prayers have been going up in girls and the guys' dorms and all over the world, I tell you, and it's finally happened. And he let us know the day before it happened. He said, we're in a prayer meeting in our dorm, and he said, it's going to happen tomorrow. And it did, and he just opened it up, and he let it fly, and that's all I can say. He told me he wanted me to get up and say something. I said, the only way you're going to get me up is to kick me out of the seat, and he did. And I tell you, it's just blessed everybody. I'm not kidding you, the, the greatest outpouring of of God's love and the Holy Spirit, and I can't express it. I tell you, I'm just amazed, and I'm glorifying his name. I'm praising his name today. I'm Dennis Kenlaw, and I've been invited to share with you something of the story of how the Spirit of the Lord came to the campus of Asbury College in 1970. That uh, morning of February 3rd in 1970, I got up early. I had to fly to Banff or to Cal Calgary, Alberta, and that's a long ways from Wilmore, Kentucky. So uh, I arose about 5, and by 6 o'clock I was in my car, drove to Louisville and caught an 8 o'clock flight for Denver, and then a flight on up to uh, Calgary. I landed in Calgary about 5 p.m. Calgary time. When I checked into the hotel, the hotel agent behind the desk said to me, I have a, an emergency note for you. And so he handed me a slip of paper with a name on it and a telephone number that I was supposed to call. I took a look at the name and the telephone number and knew instantly that it was the dean of the college. Now those were the days when college campuses were erupting, when they were locking presidents in their offices and when they were rioting on campuses and my first thought was emergency, the dean, what's happened in my absence at Asbury. So five o'clock Calgary time was about seven o'clock Wilmore time, Kentucky time. So I walked immediately across the car at before I went to my room with a Canadian dime and put it in a telephone and within uh, oh, 30 seconds I was able to get the dean. I caught him at home. He said to me, I have a problem, and I don't know quite how to handle it. And my blood pressure rose a little bit. He was a fellow who had done everything from run a one-room schoolhouse in the mountains of Kentucky to being an academic dean, and he could handle anything. I trusted him completely. And so he said, I have a problem, and I don't know how to handle it. So I said, what's that? He said, it's chapel. And I said, what do you mean, chapel? Well, he said, the chapel isn't over yet. And I said, would you repeat that, please? And he said, the morning chapel isn't over yet. I said, what do you mean it isn't over yet? It's 7 o'clock at night. He said, that's right. It isn't over yet. And I said, what happened? And then he told me. He was scheduled to speak that morning. And instead of speaking, he had given his witness. He never became a Christian until he was an adult and uh, in the realm of education. And so he simply shared his witness. And after he had shared his witness, he opened it for other students in the student body to share what Christ was doing in their lives and what he was saying to them. There was a remarkable response. About five minutes before the hour for chapel was over, a philosophy professor turned to the dean who had come down and was sitting on the front row in chapel, turned to him and said, God is here. If you give an invitation, there will be a response. He gave an invitation, and that started a response that lasted until the next Tuesday morning, a week later, at 8 o'clock, a week later, when we began classes again.
Now, I was in Calgary. I'll, I was in uh, Banff, Alberta, when I got this news. And he said to me, I have a question. He said, the TV people in Lexington, a city 15 miles from us, want to come out and uh, video what is taking place here in re and use it on the TV stations and the news reports. And I could see cynical TV men coming in to that sacred place and making a joke out of it. And so I said, keep them out. And he said, we've prayed about that. And we think we ought to let them in. And I said, well, I'm not there. You're there. And I trust you implicitly, but keep them reverent. Well, they let the TV people come in. And the TV people came, the man who headed the crew. When he came, he brought his wife. And that evening, when the 5 o'clock news came on, when he came to that clip, he said to the audience, he said, now I know that in this evening news, many of you are doing many things. Some of you ladies are preparing supper. Some of you men are reading the newspaper. Other young people, you're doing all sorts of things. I've been in the news reporting business for 34 years. I thought I had seen everything, but today I saw something that I have never seen before. And I would appreciate it if you'd stop whatever you're doing, put it down, and for the next 90 seconds, look at this film clip. And so the story of the Asbury Revival spread all over central Kentucky. It all started when one student gave his testimony. That was followed by another, and the testimonies have been going ever since. Hundreds of people from Kentucky, Indiana, and Michigan attended a testimony service on the campus of Asbury College in Wilmore. And as it spread, people began coming in from all around. It was interesting to me, uh, who was so far away, knowing about it only through the telephone. I will never, ever forget standing in a public telephone booth a day later as I called to find out what was taking place. Now, if you're not a Christian, you won't understand this. If you've never had an experience of the sense of the presence of God, you won't understand that. But in all of my life, I have never known a heavier sense of the presence of God than in that small telephone booth standing side of a roadway in Banff, Alberta, Canada. It was as if God himself came through the telephone line, and I was encompassed in God. Now, I want to say part of my reaction to that was almost fear, Dick. There was a, an apprehension in me, lest anything be done, you know, to grieve the Spirit. And also the question of, was I worthy in any sense to be a part of any of that? And could I respond as I ought to? I, there was that deep, intense consciousness that we were dealing with holy things, sacred things, even though I was far removed. Now, I didn't get back to the campus until early Friday morning. I landed in Louisville about 12 o'clock on Thursday night. I got in my automobile and drove to Wilmore. I've read the accounts in Finney's relating of the revivals in his day of how when Finney would go through a city sometimes, people would come under a profound sense of the presence of God. The closer I got to Wilmore, the heavier that sense of the presence of God got on me. When I drove my car 2.30 in the morning to the campus, I didn't go home. I went to the auditorium, and I parked. And as I came walking up the steps, I walked very slowly. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I knew I was walking in to the presence of God. You don't do that casually. I walked very slowly up the steps. There were two students standing on the steps. One of them was a student leader who that year had run for student body president. And as I walked up the steps, these two students turned to me, and the one who had run for student body president looked at me and laughed, and he said, you missed it. And I said, oh, yes, he said. And he laughed, and he said, you missed it. Well, I walked on in. Now, in a small college where you had, oh, at that time we probably had a thousand, between a thousand and eleven hundred students, a president is something of a papa figure 
He's the authority symbol and he's the leader. When I walked in, I knew that many of those young people would be waiting for me. And the question was, what was my role to be in it? Was I to go to the platform? Was I the president to involve myself? I walked in and sat down in the back corner seat as far away from the center as I could get and still know what was going on. There was that awesome sense of the presence of God and I did not want to be an unclean instrument or an unclean presence in any of it and I sat there for I suppose an hour. A format had been developed. It started in that opening chapel. A student would give his witness. He would tell about how God was dealing with him about sin in his life. He'd make his confession and then he would uh, tell how God had brought forgiveness to him and restoration or how the need of his heart had been met, the spiritual need. Man, I'm trembling. I can't As he would speak, there would be somebody in the audience who would say, that's like me. And then that person would come under conviction and come forward and kneel at the altar. So a pattern had been developed of testimony, of sharing. Then after the testimony, prayer. And after the prayer, singing and praise and adoration. And then more witnessing, sharing of how God had met human need. So as I sat there for an hour at least, I heard these students sharing what God was doing in their hearts and how their lives were being cleaned out and God was restoring them if they had known him before or else they were telling how for the first time they had found him and, uh, and how relationships were being straightened out. And as they shared, I said, I suppose I'd been there about an hour when a young lady came up and they had spotted me and she walked back and knelt side of the seat where I was sitting and looked up at me and said, Dr. Kenlaw, may I talk with you? And I said, why, yes. She said, I need help. And I said, all right, could we go somewhere where we could talk privately? The way she spoke, I knew she wanted to be able to talk privately. So we went downstairs in the auditorium and uh, sat down in a classroom and she looked at me and I looked at her and she spoke. She said, Dr. Kenlaw, I'm a liar. Excuse me. <laughs> Forgive, me. <laughs> Forgive me for a minute. She said, I lie so much, I don't even know when I'm lying. I am a liar. Now what do I do? Well, I sat there for a moment or two, and I'd never said this to anybody else, but I looked at her and I said, why don't you start back? to the last person you remember that you lied to. Confess it to that person and ask him or her to forgive you. Oh, she said, that'd kill me. I said, no, it'd probably cure you. Three days later, she came to me radiant and she said, Dr. Kinlaw, I'm free. And I said, what do you mean you're free? She said, I just hit my 34th person and I'm free. Now that was the kind of thing that was taking place, an honest, candid dealing with personal sin and with personal disobediences and with personal problems. It was marvelous the way these young people would respond. And at night, when the telephone rates were cheaper, you'd see them lined up by the telephones in the dormitories, ready to call their families or friends or someone to whom they were supposed to speak. I remember uh, later a Salvation Army officer who now is a commissioner in the Salvation Army told me about his daughter. They didn't have much money and they had a family agreement that Sue would not call home except in case of an emergency. So she called her dad and her mother. They got on their two phones, they were in New York City. And so Susan said, Dad, her dad said, Susan, what's the emergency? And she said, well, Dad, I've called a 
tell you some good news. Today, I found Jesus. And the Salvation Army officer at the other end, the father said, what do you mean? And she said, Dad, today I found Jesus. He said, honey, you've known Jesus for years. What do you mean you found Jesus? She said, no, Dad, I've never known Jesus before, but today I found Jesus. He said, honey, you've been in street meetings with me. You've run youth camps. You've witnessed up and down through this part of the country. You've been in the army all your life. What do you mean you've found Jesus? And she said, Dad, apparently you don't understand. He said, what were you doing all these years? She said, Dad, I wasn't doing those things because I loved Christ. I was doing those things because I loved you. I was doing those things because I wanted to please you. But today, I found Jesus. About his response was, he's a personal, close personal friend of mine, so he said, what's that Ken Law guy trying to do down there? <laughs> that was the only time anybody ever related anything that was going on there to me by, or to any of the rest of us that were at Asbury. But about two weeks later, she was on a witness team in Connecticut, and so the Army officer and his wife went to the Salvation Army Hall in Connecticut where she was witnessing. And after the session that night, he said, yes, she's right. She found Jesus, and now she knows him. You see, uh, things that were simply tradition became reality. Things that were simply vocabulary became human experience. And what had been tra transmitted from you know, from head to head now suddenly became living reality in people's hearts. Now, it was interesting to me what the emphasis was of the Holy Spirit in those days. There was an amazing openness and transparency. It was the kind of thing that terrifies administrators, just, you know, drives you batty because you've got a microphone up here and you've got a line of students lined up, you don't have the foggiest notion what one of them's going to say, and you don't have the foggiest notion what one of them's going to do, and you're responsible for some decorum or some rationality and all that, you see. So you sit with your heart in your throat uh, while you uh, watch all this. It was amazing the restraint of the Holy Spirit. The emphasis was never now, don't take me negatively in anything I say here. I'm just reporting. The emphasis was never upon the gifts of the Spirit. The emphasis was upon sin. The need for repentance, the need for restitution, the need for re repairing relationships, human being to human being, and the need for bringing a life into obedience to the highest and the best came to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior in 1957 when I was in the service. For about a year, I grew in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, and it was a blessed time. But although he was my Savior, I never came to the place where I completely allowed him to become Lord of all. And that's a dangerous position to be in. He'll either be Lord of all or Lord not at all eventually. And that's what happened to me. I began to drift away from the Lord after coming out of the service. And as I drifted away from the Lord, inwardly the guilt built up, the self-condemnation built up, a burden began to press heavier and heavier upon me. And in this backslidden state, I came to Asbury as a student, went through three years here, graduated, left here, eventually went to graduate school, and eventually came back on the other side of the death still in a backslidden state, no longer having a living union with Jesus Christ, no longer having anything that was fresh and vital from the Lord day after day, living on past experience, living on past spiritual insights. In other words, in good biblical language, I was a hypocrite, and the guilt continued to build up, and the condemnation continued to build up, and it was heavy. And then God came down on February 3rd, and I knew God was here. And in spite of my backslidden state, I still sensed that he was here, and I even rejoiced on occasion. 
but at night in my office, I'd pray and seek the Lord because I knew I wasn't right. And I didn't have the courage to admit it before the student body and before my fellow faculty members. And until we humble ourselves, God can't do much for us. And God dealt with me for an entire week. And a week later, on February the 10th, the following Tuesday, God gave me the grace, and I thank him for it. He gave me the grace to acknowledge my sin and hypocrisy before this body. And I thank him for it because when he, he gave me the grace to humble myself and acknowledge my need, he met that need. And he took the guilt away and the self-condemnation away and the burden away and replaced it with a peace and a joy and a presence that I don't want to lose again. And I praise him for it, great things he has done and is doing and is going to do as we obey and follow the Lord. You see, when you get a, when you get a doctorate in Bible who will stand up in front of a whole student body and look at his students and say, I have a confession to make. I have cheated you, students, because I have not properly prepared for my classes. And I've gone into classes not as well prepared as I should be, and I stand here today to ask you to forgive me. Now, I count that as revival. It was interesting. That man's life was transformed. Doctorate in Bible. His life was transformed, and he would share that with you. And for years after, you, you could tell a freshness and a sweetness and the presence of God in his life in a, in, a, in a very beautiful way. Now, that's the way God moved through that week. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things to me was that by Friday when I returned, the word had spread all across the country. In fact, before that week was out, one of our students was on the West Coast and Maybe it been more, but I know at least one was on the West Coast sharing in a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian college what happened. Another student was on the East Coast. We, that weekend, after it began on Tuesday, our students were all over the United States and in Canada. Now, what I thought was that God had turned something over in their souls, and it had been so good that they knew they had to share it, and so they scattered out across the United States to share it, going back to their homes and so forth. Now, that was partially true. What was more impressive was that by Thursday, we began to get calls from all over the United States and from Canada saying, we'll be glad to pay the way for a group of students if you'll send a group of students up to share with us what's taking place there. And so there were students in Canada, there were students, as I said, from the East Coast to the West Coast and to the Gulf of Mexico. And they were speaking in places, witnessing in places, where no one from Asbury had sought an opportunity or taken the initiative. The Holy Spirit was at work at the other end in hunger, and people were saying, well, somebody come tell us about it. Now, one of the most beautiful things and impressive things to me was the way the Spirit worked. There was no preaching through any of that eight days. It was only sharing, witnessing. And the amazing thing was that as a person would tell what had happened, it would be recapitulated. As a person would go somewhere and tell what God had done in Hughes Auditorium, it would take place in the church where the person was telling it. I have a friend who now is a... Church of the Nazarene District Superintendent. At that time, he was the pastor of one of the college churches in the Church of the Nazarene. He was in revival, and he had an evangelist, and he had a quartet that was singing that night, and their service was on the radio. At about 12 minutes of 8 or a quarter of 8, one of his ushers came to him and said, uh, Dr. Irwin, there are two students out here from Asbury College, and they say they want to talk with you. They say a revival is broken out at Asbury. And he said, oh. So he said, bring them in. So they came in, and here Don stood with his evangelist in the quartet. And uh, these, he looked at these two students. He said they weren't very impressive looking. But there they stood and looked at him, and he said, yes. And they said, we're from Asbury College. 
God has come to Asbury. And he told us to come tell you that he'd come to Asbury and that he wanted to come to your college. And that was all they said. And he said, oh, well, that's wonderful. What do you want to do? And some way or other, the idea was suggested that they share in the evening service. He'd never laid eyes on these two boys before. He was not about to turn his pulpit over to them. He didn't know what they would do. And so they said, oh, that's not our problem. Our problem was to do what he told us to do, and we've done it, and we're clean. He said, well, maybe you should tell about it. Could you do it in five minutes? Oh, they said, we don't have to do it. We've done what we were told to do. He said, let's take five minutes. So they sang a number, and these, he introduced the first student and said, we have two students here tonight from Asbury College. They tell us that God has come to the campus of Asbury College and they want to tell us about it. So one of these boys, he said they took their coats off and were there in their shirt sleeves, and he said that was sort of offensive to me. You can remember that was 1970. But he said, nevertheless, he said the first one stood up and simply said, in, tu in chapel on Tuesday, the Holy Spirit came to Asbury campus. He touched our hearts, our lives. We're different. Our campus is different. And we've just come to tell you what he's done for us. And he sat down. Don told me, he said, it may have taken him a minute and 40 seconds. The second guy stood up. And in less than, I think, maybe four minutes, both of them had finished what they were going to say. And Don, the pastor, said to me, I sighed with relief and said, well, that's over with. Unless you're a preacher, you don't understand that. But if you're a preacher, you understand that. So he said, now we can get on with the service. So they introduced the quartet. The quartet sang one verse. And when they got ready to sing, the, before they could move into the second verse, the bass in the quartet, if I remember correctly, one of the quartet members, stopped, raised his hand and stopped him and said, God has spoken to me. I need him to do for me what those guys say he's done for them. He walked down out of the pulpit, left his quartet, got down on his knees at the altar, and at 10 o'clock that night, there were more people in that church than there were at 8, and revival ran through the night. It was almost the less impressive the student was, the more effective an instrument he was. One little girl that was so shy, if she told you her name, she'd blush, went home to her home area and on a Sunday spoke in five churches. And if my memory is correct, I think there were 200 people that responded. Where the story was told, it was like a spark going from a fire, hitting dry brush, and it would break and break out. Now, it spread that way. It spread to campuses. It spread to churches. It crossed denominational lines. Most of us at Asbury are United Methodists. The revival probably had a larger numerical impact in the Southern Baptist Convention than it did in the United Methodist Church. One student went to Southwestern Baptist Seminary and a revival broke out in the classroom in Southwestern Baptist Seminary. Now, it was a work of God. It was interesting the way the media responded to it. I remember they didn't all respond alike. I remember one newspaper reporter that called me, and he was asking me about it by telephone, and he said, you call this a spontaneous revival? And I said, yes. He said, now really what you mean is, haven't you had these kinds of things before? And I said, yes, we have, over a period of years. And he said, uh, what you mean is that you had a group on your campus who said, now we haven't had a spontaneous revival in a long time, we better have one, hadn't we? I said, sir, we have a group of people like that on this campus all the time, but they don't seem to be able to produce it. 
He said, well, sir, how do you account for this? I said, I would suspect that this would be difficult for you. But the only way I know how to explain it is that last Tuesday morning, Jesus walked into Hughes Auditorium, and he's been here ever since. And a community is paying tribute to his presence. And that's the way we felt about it. I couldn't get my wife to stay home and cook meals. You couldn't get her out of Hughes Auditorium. If Jesus physically, literally came to this campus, you'd forget everything. And that's the way we were. You couldn't keep us out of Hughes Auditorium. There is where the Holy Presence was. There have been missionaries in India 16 years just prior to our coming here, and we have seen some wonderful, miraculous movements of the Spirit there. But I've never witnessed anything like this, the sheer awesome power of God in our midst. In February, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And to paraphrase the words of Hosea, the Holy Spirit came and watered the dry plains of my soul like the spring rains watered the earth. And I found the secret of a victorious life, not always happy and not always on the mountaintop, but I have victory over everyday circumstances and frustrations that plague the life of every human. And I'm grateful, and I praise the name of Jesus Christ that I don't have to spend another day of my life without the reality of Jesus Christ in my life and without the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, how did it come? What caused it? No question in my mind, but one of the things was our need. <laughs> we, we needed it a lot worse than anybody else around. Uh, and God honors need in his mercy, in his infinite mercy. But another thing, we had some students who were interested in prayer. One young lady became deeply concerned for the blessing of God on our campus. So she gathered a group around her and they started praying. In October, before the Spirit came in February, six students came together and banded together in what they called the Great Experiment. They covenanted for 30 days to take 30 minutes every morning and spend in prayer with the Word, writing down what truth they got from the Word they were to obey that day, sharing their faith somewhere in the course of a day, and meeting once a week for those 30 days and checking up on each other to see that each one had done his disciplines that, that, that week. So for 30 days they met that way and they worked that way. At the end of that 30 days, we came to the, toward the end of the fall term. At the beginning of the winter term, each one of those six picked up five people. And so there were six groups of six that were getting up every morning for 30 minutes extra to pray and spend in uh, time with God. That experiment ended the 30th, first, I think, of January. On the 31st of January, they had the chapel, and there were 36 of them on the platform. And those 36 shared what that great experiment had done for them. And they had in every seat in the auditorium a commitment slip. And they asked every student in the student body to commit himself to become a part of a group of six who would, just for 30 days, who would engage in this experiment. That was on Saturday, the 31st of January. In some ways, that was the most impressive chapel I think I ever saw at Asbury, students sharing what time with God had done for them. It was, that was on the 31st. The next chapel was Tuesday, the 3rd of February. Now, in addition to this, the, the young lady that I told you about in her group, they had gone to proper authorities and asked for a chance to have a place for prayer and so forth, and they would meet for prayer. And then they started having night prayer meetings, and they called an all-night prayer meeting in Hughes Auditorium, and a large group of them gathered around the altar. Now, here's the way they worked. They were praying for God to come, and when they would finish a prayer meeting, they'd look at each other and say, do you think he'll come today? Takes students, doesn't it? Takes young people, doesn't it? 
They'd finish their prayer meeting and they'd look at each other and say, do you think he'll come today? They had one all-night prayer meeting and I think somewhere around 2.30, they, call, they got each other together and stood around the altar and held hands and said, that's enough, he's coming. <laughs> and he went home and went to bed. And he did. And he let us know the day before it happened, he said, during a prayer meeting in our dorm, and he said, it's going to happen tomorrow. And it did, and he just opened it up and he let it fly. Now, uh, out of all the experiences that Elsie and I have ever had, we have never known anything like that. And you know, the thing we find ourselves yearning for now is to see it again. I came to the place where deep in my heart I thought, you know, every generation of students ought to have the chance to see that once, once, once. Every generation of people ought to have a chance to see it once. And I believe God wants to do it again. I believe there's some stirrings, some moving. And I think it will depend on you and me. If I understand what God has done here and what the students here feel, they seem to me to be saying that we have found together one who can make bad people good and the best of people better, and that that power is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. We know that we have found an answer. We believe that it is the answer to the needs of the heart of man, both corporately and individually. That answer is new life in Christ through repentance for sin, faith in a living Christ, and immediate obedience to his holy will. And this is what we commend to you.